I'm a Barbie girl in the Barbie world. Life in plastic, it's fantastic. You can brush my hair, undress me everywhere. Imagination, life is your creation. Not the words of Confucius or the Dalai Lama. In fact, the words of Aqua, the pop group. Guess what? Today's the story of Barbie. There you go. And how the doll was born. Welcome to Patented. It's a podcast all about the history of inventions from History Hit. I'm Dallas Campbell. Before we start, I want you to meet Tristan Panero. It's an apartment block. It's about 15 foot tall and it has all these different rooms in there and different scenes going on. So these are Barbie scenes played out on your walls, like dioramas. Yes. Uh, that, that's the laundrette. Ken, Ken's sitting there waiting for his clothes to be ready and he's being accosted. Ken's naked! And three Barbies are looking at naked Ken washing his smalls. <laughs> I, I, I like to think it's art. Some people just like to think it's a load of tat, but I, I you know, it pleases me. Tristan is a high-flying PR executive who lives in Brighton, England, with his husband and more than 600, count them, Barbie dolls. As a child, I had all the action men and all the war toys that were always bought for me as a little boy for Christmas and birthdays and stuff. One day, my grandmother, who'd bought me this tank and a few action men, said, "Where?" why aren't you playing with them? What are you doing? And I was clearly quite a literal child. And I said, well, they went to war and they died. Um, I, I, uh, I, I thought, in, in my mind, once they'd fought each other and, and they'd been shot and died, I was like, that's it, game over. Which she obviously thought was quite amusing. And, and she said, well, why don't you play with them before they go to work whilst they're still at home? And I thought, that sounds, that sounds a bit boring. So that's when she bought me my first doll she said well here's here's a girlfriend for you action man um make up some stories with them so i did and i've i've been hooked ever since he now shares his home with star wars barbie star trek barbies tim burton barbie doctor who barbie marilyn monroe and j-lo barbies david bowie there who's he's classic barbie material some of the original rock star barbies which i've had from the 80s with share in the background Oh, come on. That's excellent. So that is a Cher Barbie. That's Cher as in straddling the big cannon on the ship. Yes, Cher. yes. In her in her Bob Mackey, big frizzly hair. And then I've got stuff like, you know, 1980s Joan Collins's dynasty, That's Alexis Carrington. Awesome. That's awesome. See, this is the thing. They are like little snapshots of the past, aren't they? Little sna- cultural snapshots of where we were and what we were thinking and what we were excited about. Uh, just about Every anything that's in popular culture. So everything from a Barbie. I don't have a Barbie yet. I want to have a Barbie. You need a Barbie in your life. Barbie is a mirror to whatever cultural moment we happen to be in. A lightning rod for debate in the shape of an eleven and a half inch plastic toy. They're not afraid of taking chances and of upsetting people. And sometimes they get it really wrong and sometimes they get it really right. So just What's a really can you give us a really wrong example? There was a there was a teenage Barbie who could speak who, who was at school and you'd push her button and she'd say all these different phrases. One of the phrases that got everyone up in arms, understandably, was math is really hard. <laughs> it kind of perpetuated this idea that, you know, that girls aren't good at maths or, you know, anything like that, and they should just stick to to what they know. So that was an example where they got it really wrong. But recently, they've just released this one, which is the first transgender Barbie. So it's based on Laverne Cox, a trans actress, but probably best known for Orange is the New Black on Netflix. And, And just the fact that it's a doll of a transgender woman is is groundbreaking. How did this doll that is so much more than a doll come to be in the first place. For that, we have to go back to the 1950s and to a time where toy choices for girls were pretty limited, limited to the dull and the duller. But enter Ruth Handler, a toy manufacturer with an idea for how to fix things. To hear the story of how Ruth created a toy that changed childhood for millions across the world, it's time to introduce my guest for this episode, Tanya Stone. Tanya is a children's writer and a full-time academic teaching creative writing. She's also the author of The Good, The Bad and The Barbie, a doll's history and her impact on us. All 
day I've just been listening to that bloody song by Aqua. <laughs> I'm a Barbie girl in a bar. Uh, you know, did that was that big in America? It is. People like it. Do they? It's I horrific. Guess. It is horrific. First of all, I'm going to introduce you because you've written, I think, like a thousand books, an obscene amount of books. There must be some kind of record for how many books you've written. How many books are you up to now? I think 105. How on earth can you write 105 books? I don't know. I'm on, I'm on one and, I'm, and that, that nearly killed me. <laughs> Just explain to our listeners how on earth you got involved writing a book about Barbie. Well, it's a very good question, especially since most of my books have a bit of a feminist bent. People are sort of like, you wrote a book about Barbie? Like, what is that about? So I wrote a biography about Ella Fitzgerald for a series at Viking, which is part of Penguin Random House, called Up Close. And my editor called me and asked me if I would like to do another book in that series and what would I suggest for my topic. And so I said, okay, well, let's review the criteria. The Up Close series is focused on American 20th century icons that kids are familiar with and had a big impact on our culture. So I said, Barbie. And she laughed at me. (laughs) And, And I said, no, I'm quite serious, actually. And she said, okay, well, then pitch it. So I pitched it and she took it to the publisher and the publisher said, I love it. Tell her she can do it as a standalone title and come at it from however she likes. I think it's really interesting. It's funny, actually, because on YouTube, when I was thinking about this, they've got eight Barbie ads in a, in a row going back from when Barbie was invented in, in the mid 50s up till now. And when I say Barbie is a cultural barometer, it's exactly what it is. You see what Barbie means in 1956, which is all about, look, you can get married and you can look lovely and blah, 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 all the way up to Barbie adverts in 2022, which is all about kind of digital Barbie and all kinds of things. She is the sort of uh, mirror of our social anxieties and our ideologies and our cultural thoughts. Yes, and we can talk more about that as well, because I would say that Ruth Handler never thought that Barbie was about, look, you can get married and have children. Wait, you mentioned a name, Ruth Handler. Who's Ruth Handler? Ruth Handler was the woman who conceived of Barbie. She and her husband and another guy named Matt Matson, who was out of the picture fairly quickly, started a little toy company called Mattel. That toy company started out, their big hit was Hot Wheels, the race cars. Which is still going, I think, or yeah. are they still going? I don't know. Well, maybe I'm just really old. I remember Hot Wheels. <laughs> so so that she was fun. responsible for Mattel. Obviously, that's a massive toy company. Do we know what, much about her? Like, why did she start Mattel? Where's What's her background? Yeah. So it's actually a really um, fascinating Jewish immigrant story. And it's a feminist story. And it's American cultural history story. So it's kind of got all of these components to it all together. Ruth Handler grew up in Denver, Colorado, the child of immigrants, big family. And she met her future husband, Elliot Handler, at a dance, you know, in Denver as teenagers. Long story short, they dated for a long time. Some of the family was against it because he was not wealthy and didn't have much aspiration because he was an artist. But they persevered and they ended up getting married. And they moved from Denver to LA. And Ruth made this beautiful, these beautiful things. And he started making lucite little pieces of furniture, like miniatures, out of lucite, which was a, you know, a new material at the time, right? Like post-World War II, lucite. What's lucite? Is it it like Bakelite? Yeah, but it's clear. Remember in the 50s and 60s, there were like full-size furniture (laughs) that was that clear plastic, shiny, really, really hard, unbreakable? So he was melting it and, and fashioning it into these little pieces of furniture. And she's so like, he was an artist. He was an artist as well. He was an artist. That was his main thing. And she was an entrepreneur. She was the one with the business savvy. Yeah. And she said, you know, your stuff is beautiful. We can sell it. And they started this company. And so fast forward, they got married. They had kids, Barbara and Kenneth. Ah, there you go. There you go. So uh, they've got two children called Barbara And Ken, hmm, sounds familiar. And she is, A, aware of what the doll choices are for girls at this point, which I'll get into in a second. Hmm. And B, watching her daughter and their friends be frustrated with their play experiences, right? So at the time in the 50s, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, really the only dolls that existed for girls were baby dolls. Mm -hmm. And then came paper dolls. And girls were really kind of tired of just being told that they can play mama and take care of little baby dolls. They wanted to do other things. So the paper dolls were really, really popular, right? But they were very frustrating because they would break. They would tear. 
They had those little tabs of all the clothing. Yes, I remember. So when you say paper dolls, yeah, just for younger listeners who might not remember, they are literal just flat bits of paper with tabs and you can kind of make human shapes out of them. Yes. And so there were dolls that were paper. And then there were endless outfits that were paper that had all these little tabs around the, the limbs. So you could cut out the outfits and fold it around your paper doll and change their clothing and be more imaginative in your play than you could with a baby doll. That's quite interesting. Just so at that point, as a as a young girl, you were limited in terms of your aspirations, in terms of your play to that of a mother and, and, ba- and baby doll. Exactly. And so Ruth observed that, right? She's watching her daughter and her daughter's friends be frustrated with this experience. And she thought, what if I could make this experience different with a three-dimensional doll where girls could actually literally change the clothing and pretend to be anything they wanted to be? What would that be like? And that's where the inspiration came from. And that's how she started to think about what would the doll look like? And she really wanted the body of the doll to be a young woman, not a child, not a baby, not a child. She wanted them to be able to impose whatever their imagination could impose upon this figure. And if you think about what figure was popular in those days, right? This was the day of Audrey Hepburn and, and, you know, Betty Davis and all of these curvy starlets, Marilyn Monroe. I'm amazed that there was no dolls, I mean, other than the, the paper dolls and, and baby dolls up to this point. It's like, I'm just trying to work out, like, was there something in her, obviously she's, she, you know, she spotted that, she spotted that gap in the market, but where did the idea to, okay, are we gonna, I'm going to make a, an adult doll? Like, in a way, there's a, there's a kind of a leap there, a kind of a leap of logic. That was Ruth's brain. Ru- Ruth, Ruth wanted girls to be able to be whoever they wanted to be. Ruth was a tomboy. Ruth didn't play with dolls as a girl. Ruth wasn't a girly girl. She had no figure anywhere like Barbie. She wasn't like that. She wasn't that kind of woman. She wanted girls to just be able to do whatever they dreamed of like she did, right? You couldn't tell Ruth Handler what to do. Nobody could. (laughs) Okay, Okay. Okay, so we've got a nice picture of Ruth. So you mentioned the the figure of Barbie, that sort of the Barbie shape that we no, is a kind of reflection of Hollywood, I suppose, at the time. So Marilyn Monroe and, and Audrey Hepburn. But there's a kind of, there's an interesting story that I that I read about, which is her sort of eureka moment, because there was a kind of proto-Barbie that originated in Germany, I think? That's right. The Build Lily doll. The, say again, the Build Lily the doll. The Build Lily doll. Around the time that she was dreaming this up and kind of playing with it around in her head, she and Elliot went on holiday. And they were in Germany. And in a window, in a store window, she saw, wait for it, an adult male novelty, an adult novelty doll intended for men. Almost exactly as what she had dreamed of that Barbie would look like. So this is a kind of a, a physical, you know, I always imagine there's sort of pictures on, on, on airplanes in the 1940s and 50s of kind of like shapely women in not wearing very much. Yeah, the Build Lily doll looked very much like the original Barbie doll. Very much. Okay. Um, she, she saw that doll and she said, yes, this is what I want. And she bought a doll and she brought it back to Mattel as a prototype. But that's so that, that doll, that German doll was very much designed because, I mean, the character of, of Bill Lilly was very much the kind of... Vavavoom. Vavavoom kind of, you know, a seducer of men. Da, 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 that was the sort of comic joke. I'm just trying to understand, like, what did Ruth see in that? That she thought, actually, no, 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 I can take that idea and turn it into an aspirational yeah i'll tell you what it was it was the mannequin shape because for ruth barbie was a hundred percent about the clothes the ability to drive the play experience by changing the outfit it's a brilliant marketing concept and it allows the the person playing with the doll to do whatever they'd like with it so the shape of barbie for ruth was about it being a teeny tiny mannequin. And so that girls could very easily sort of see, I guess we might say in her mind, the ideal figure for clothing. So that clothing would look really, really good. Because the interesting thing is they look absolutely, you mentioned it just now, they look absolutely identical. Like for example, Barbie's has bizarre pointy breasts. You know, these were presumably designed originally in the German doll for the male gaze. And now suddenly you've got, I'm, I'm surprised that she didn't sort of take that doll as an idea and then actually make it a little bit different, make it a little less racy, a little less saucy. 
I think it was actually toned down a little bit, but clearly not enough for those who were repelled by it initially, including all the men at Mattel. It, it, that's interesting. So, what, so she has this idea. She's like, I know, we're going to stop making Hot Wheel toys and toys for boys. Well, no, and, not and, stop. They never stopped. Oh, they didn't stop. Okay, but we're going to branch out. What was the kind of reaction? Uh, well, first of all, when was Barbie launched? When was Barbie Unit 1? It was 1959. Okay, so 1959, and what was the reaction? So it was this big toy show, right, in New York, and the response was not good, and Ruth was crushed. People sort of had these opinions that, like, they liked it, but it wasn't appropriate for kids. Even Elliot didn't like it. And what kind of clothes were on it? Because you, you said, okay, this is, Barbie essentially was a, was a mannequin, and, and this play experience was having different, different outfits, as one could imagine. She was probably wearing the swimsuit, the zebra Strike oh, yes, you're holding it up to the camera here. Uh, so that's a sort of classic Marilyn Monroe-esque Betty Davis stripy swimsuit. So basically mirroring the fashions of the day, but still quite kind of racy. And well, and Elliot said, Ruth, no mother is going to buy her daughter a doll with breasts. <laughs> right. And she disagreed. She disagreed and she persevered and kind of won everybody over, for better or worse. It's funny when you look at that 90, I think it's a 1959 commercial, which is on, it's on YouTube, and you look at that. And, mm-hmm. you, you know, if, if Ruth designed Barbie, named after her daughter, obviously, uh, to be aspirational, it's still very much like the, the very end shot of that advert is Barbie in a wedding dress. It all kind of builds up to you are going to get married. As, as, the, as the sort of aspirational thing. I suppose that argument could be made, sure. I mean, I think it's in Ruth's mind, if I may, it was about glamour and fashion and malleability. <laughs> the fact that you could pop Barbie's head off was intentional, not so that you could bash her about, which is a whole other topic, but because that made it easier to change the clothes. It was all about the clothes for Ruth, absolutely. Uh, so Ruth was obviously a big fashion person, was she? She was. was she- she took her appearance very, very seriously. Not to be sexy, just to be polished and powerful. So when did... So Barbie's launched 1959. Mattel are kind of a little bit nonplussed about it. When did it suddenly... When did Barbie suddenly start to become popular or or, or even a cultural icon? So it's hard to... I, I was trying to remember the dates because, thankfully, it's not my memory that's at fault here. Mm. It was actually difficult to pinpoint for the historians. It's a, mm. I wrote... It's hard to know whether it simply took time for the public to notice or if the end of the school year prompted kids to buy toys to play with in their newly found free time or if some other factor altogether was involved but suddenly Barbie was a hit. Like when school was out, it just started disappearing off the shelves and, you know, it skyrocketed from there. But the interesting thing about Barbie is that, or I suppose the popularity of Barbie is that Barbie changes as, as we change culturally. That is something that I personally like about Barbie. I think what people like about Barbie is very individual. Yeah, we just sort of, we, we project onto Barbie whatever we want. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that was sort of my authorial conclusion after doing all this research and collecting, you know, 500 plus anecdotes from people was that there really isn't one view about Barbie pro or con. It is really about what people project onto it. And interestingly, what I really saw was that adults had more of a problem with her than kids. Even adults who liked her as a kid or didn't like her as a kid mm-hmm. didn't like her so much as an adult because of those projections. Yeah, well, if you're if you're a feminist, you're going to look at Barbie in a very different lens than than perhaps if you're not. Right, and and I am absolutely a feminist, and I think it's a plastic doll. Like, I don't think Barbie is some. No, evil. it's a Rorschach test, isn't it? It's a Rorschach test. We sort of see see whatever we want. I'm quite interested in the anecdotes. You said you collected 500 plus an- anecdotes. I'm interested just sort of generally on both sides. What are the good goody Barbie? Why do people like Barbie, and why do people hate Barbie? So people liked Barbie for the very reasons that Ruth wanted to invent Barbie. People liked Barbie because they could make her anything they wanted. They could pretend to be anything they wanted. And she reflected a lot of things in the doll world that wasn't even happening in real life. Like astronaut Barbie existed long before women were allowed into the space program. There was a surgeon Barbie before there were very many women being able to be other something other than nurses. Can I just ask, when did, when did that sort of change happen? So when did the Barbie costumes go from being wedding dresses, swimsuits, and high fashion into things like astronaut, surgeon? Surprisingly early on, actually. The first major change that happened was in the early 70s. 
I'm going to show you a picture now. Okay, I will describe it to our dear listeners. The early 70s, when, of course, in America at least, there was a huge women's movement happening, Ms. Magazine and Gloria Steinem, and, right? And this is what changed, and it changed forever. So that doll that is, that is the original doll, if you can see, she's looking very coyly sort of down and off to the side. But the straightforward direct gaze of the next iteration of Barbie was a reflection of that women's movement and never left us. That's really, yeah, how interesting. So not just the clothes, but the actual physical look of Barbie changed uh, with, the, with the women's movement in the 1970s. And then suddenly Barbie had became an astronaut and a surgeon and a doctor. and a. Well, right. So even though the 90, 1960s had a lot of stereotypical roles, like mm -hmm. women, teachers, stewardess, nurse, mm -hmm. Barbies, mm -hmm. in 1973, Barbie became a surgeon. Now, I wrote a lot about the nuances of that in my book, The Good, the Bad, and the Barbie, because it wasn't so straightforward as just, let's celebrate that Barbie's a surgeon, because some of those outfits, even in those empowering roles, were also still pretty saucy. <laughs> so then there's this whole debate about like, okay, Barbie's a surgeon, but she's sort of dressed in an outfit that um, probably in real life she would not walk into a hospital wearing. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? What was the, and, and tell me about the, the, the sort of negative reaction to Barbie. I think really the over all overarching negative feedback and experience from Barbie is about body image. And that really hits across a lot of ages and a lot of different types of girls and women and anyone who identifies as female because the body type really never changed much. Not enough really to perhaps take away that feeling of not feeling good about your body if that's how you saw her. You know, if you were of the half, maybe more, female identifying people who look at Barbie and say, I will never be that. That's a perfection I can never achieve. That's a pretty hefty negative. And I think that's one that persists and actually affects a lot of parents in their negative attitudes because they don't want to do anything that will impose that kind of feeling upon their kids. And the footnote here is whether or not their kids will actually ever see it that way. But she's still out there. And anytime uh, something happens in the news, like it's a 50th anniversary or there's a live action movie coming out, there's a surge again of conversation, debate, popularity, negativity. You know, it's all it's it's fascinating to me, Barbie, because it's such a vehicle for conversation and debate. Well, it really is. I mean, it is a cultural phenomenon, Barbie. And, and like, you know, I said at the beginning, this idea that Barbie is a cultural barometer. I think she really is. The fact that what we, what we as, or what the makers of Barbie sort of decide, okay, Barbie's going to wear this now, or Barbie's going to look like this, is very much a reflection of what's going on in our conversations that we have in society about all the things, I mean, of, you know, sort of gender and the role of women and all these kinds of things are going to be sort of manifest in the way that Barbie is. Just tell us, if you would, just... How big a cultural impact do you think Barbie has? It's a, it's a hard question to answer. I mean, who, who, how, how do you even calibrate that? Really? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, you think of sort of Hollywood movie stars like Marilyn Monroe, sort of is sort right. of up there as these kind of these these kind of points. Like, I, I think it's pretty high on the list, right? Yeah, because that. I mean, I think that's the barometer right there. Everybody knows who Barbie is. Everybody knows who Barbie is. That's that's a pretty high impact. And I think there's a movie coming out as well, isn't there? I think Margot Robbie and uh, Ryan Gosling are going to play Barbie and Ken. There, or did I dream that? Maybe I had a cheese dream. That'll be interesting. Really? I, well, actually, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie. That's so funny because I did a whole chapter on Barbie as art. There's a wonderfully talented artist, American artist named Margot Lang, who makes jewelry out of Barbie parts. Oh, wow, there you go. Let me that's see if I can of, find a picture to show cool. you. So you're ha holding up to the camera it's jewelry made out of... Wow, that's something made out of Barbie's breasts. What is that? Exactly. It's a necklace made out it's of Barbie's necklace. breasts. There you go. I think that definitely established Barbie as high cultural icon. And of course, Andy Warhol painted her. Of course. Well, there you go. The fact that Warhol's painted her. This is the thing. She trend. I think she transcends that sort of division because she's become so divisive it actually has become an interesting cultural phenomenon right it, it, high culture low culture right so let's just talk about the future do you think barbie has a future or have we have we sort of gone to peak barbie has barbie become so postmodern that it, it will no longer or maybe we're into sort of post postmodern barbie that's a really interesting question I, I put barbie sort of in the category of classic american toys 
that will probably last forever. I agree, because it touches, you know, whether you're a kid or, or you're interested in gender politics, Barbie kind of plays a role, I think. Tanya, just tell us, you, 109 books, did you say? 105. 105. I actually have a new book coming out. In tell September. us all about it. it. Tell us all about your new book. Well, it is quite different, Dallas, the, from this topic. So this new book is called Peace is a Chain Reaction. It's a really beautiful, obscure, triangulated story. The inciting incident takes place in May of 1945 during World War II, when six people were killed in Oregon on the west coast of America by a Japanese balloon bomb that had been launched and had landed in the forest. There were actually 9,000 of these balloons that landed on the continental U.S. soil. Oh, wow. And that is the inciting incident, but the whole book is really a a 30-year-long story that has to do with a Japanese-American man named Yuzura Takeshita, who grew up to be an anthropologist, sociologist, went to Japan, met up with a woman who was one of the hundreds of Japanese schoolgirls who made the paper balloons for these bombs. And they discussed the death of these six Americans in the context of the larger war and what that meant as individuals. And it kind of sparked this 30-year-long relationship between a, a, a large group of Japanese women who had made these balloons during World War II when they were kids and the families of the victims of the people who died in Bly, Oregon. And they had memorial services and letters back and forth and gifts back and forth. Just sort of a reminder that one person can forge peace in this crazy world we're living in. That's a really, really interesting story. I can tell you're a creative writing person because you use words like inciting incident. (laughs) (laughs) Tanya, Tanya, thank you so much for telling us about the invention of Barbie. It's lovely to hear the story of Ruth. Thanks so much for having me. It was really fun. Okay, there you go. Barbie, that is it. Thanks for listening. If you want to see Tristan's collection, follow him on Instagram at tristan.pinero on Instagram. And if you want more from Tanya, then her book, The Good, The Bad and The Barbie is out. So you should definitely get a hold of that. I think it's a really interesting story, much more than a doll. This is a story about culture, about politics, about all kinds of things. Listen, if you've enjoyed today's episode, and I hope you have, please leave a review and a rating, etc, etc. It helps others discover the show and helps us, well, it gives us a sense of pride and a sense of fulfilment and a sense that we want to keep on making it. Uh, and don't forget, get in touch with your suggestions for other episodes. We've had loads of suggestions for other episodes, which we're going to do. So if you've got a, an invention or a story or a thing or a question or uh, you know something you're curious about get in touch and we'll stick it on the list and you never know we might actually make it and we'll name check you of course if we do see you soon